with you. So now, give us these things. We ask in the strong and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. All right. (laughs) I finally get to preach the last sermon on the book of Philippians. It's been a crazy month for us. And then as I think, looking back to where... (laughs) When we started this in February, holy cow, it seems like we've been in this book forever because so much has gone on in our church and also in the world. So in God's providence, though, I do think it's been a timely book for us because of what we've been going through. And it's hard to believe that it's now over. And because this is the last sermon, I want to give you somewhat of a preview of what we're going to be doing uh, for the rest of the summer and then in the fall. Because we haven't had our vacation yet, I don't know when we're going to get that. So we're going to have two guest preachers uh, over the next two weeks, and then I'm going to do a couple of standalone sermons to get us to the end of August, and then in August, we're going to start the book of Hosea. (laughs) I've always wanted to preach this book until I started reading it last week, and I was like, oh man, here we go again. This is going to be a difficult book, but I'm looking forward to preaching it, and hopefully it's going to take us all the way into the Advent season. So that's the, the plan. But I gotta be honest, I'm sad that we're, we're done with Philippians. I really am. Because I found this book feeding and nourishing my soul in unexpected ways. I found this book, because every year in the month of June is when I'm running on fumes, I'm ready for a break, and I don't get it this year, but God has sustained me through it. And this book has been a big part of that. And the picture that Paul paints of Jesus in chapter 2, which was our scripture reading, it's one of the most beautiful Christological representations of Jesus in all of the Bible. You see, this book has forever changed my understanding of who God is. It has forever changed my understanding of what it means for us to be made in the image of God. It has forever changed and given me a greater understanding of how God relates to himself in the Trinity. It's given me a greater understanding of sin and how to recognize sin in our lives. It's given me a great understanding of our purpose as human beings and our purpose as a church in this world. In other words, the book of Philippians is a life-changing letter because standing at the center of all of life change, Standing at the center of all of our growth in the Christian life, all of sanctification is chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. So when people want to talk about growth in the Christian life, when they want to talk about what is sanctification, all you got to do is read Philippians 2, 6 to 11 to see it. Because what is sanctification? What is growth in the Christian life? It's growing more in Christ's likeness. It's not seeking to vainly grasp for your glory or greatness. It's being willing to let go of your glory. Being willing to let go of greatness for the good of others. It's considering others as more important than yourself. Because as God, Jesus did not count equality with God as something for him to grab a hold of and keep. No, he let it go. He let his glory as God go for our good and for his Father's glory. But he didn't just let go of his glory. He emptied himself of that glory and took on the form of a slave. A slave who seeks the interests of others above his own. A slave who serves by becoming obedient. Obedient to the point of death, Paul says, even the death of a Roman cross. And because of Jesus' humble descent, God the Father highly exalts him and bestows on him the name that is above every name. So that at this name... Every knee in heaven, on earth, and under the earth will bow. And every tongue will confess, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in these six verses, Paul's covering all of human history from beginning to end. And who Jesus is and what Jesus has done to accomplish salvation stands at the center of it. 
It stands at the very center of it, which means all of human history is about the exaltation of Christ. The goal, the focus of all of history is Jesus. This is why Paul says, I'm running the race for the prize of gaining Jesus. I want to know him more and more. I strive with all of my might to know him bigger, to know him better. And the reason why is because for Paul, life, Christ, death, gain. The greatest philosophy in all of the world. Because what can you do to a person who believes that? You put him in prison, and what does Paul say? That just means I get to understand Jesus' suffering even more. You kill him, thank you, he says, because now I can finally go to be with him. Life, Christ, death, gain. And the implications that we looked at of chapter 2, verses 6 to 11, it, it shows us also the kind of community that God is actually recreating through Jesus' humble descent and glorious ascent. A community of believers who bow the knee to Jesus as Lord. And because Jesus is their Lord, they willingly deny themselves in order to provide for others. They're willing to die to themselves for the good of others. They're willing to let go of their pursuit for greatness and live in the pursuit of trying to make others great. A community that selflessly sacrifices and serves one another. A community that builds each other up in unity because they consider others as more important than themselves. A community that works out in the gym of the gospel, not in the gym of self-effort. <laughs> A community that runs the race of the Christian life by continually resting in God's grace. A community that will stand together in unity and live out the truths of the gospel even when there is relational conflict. Because they will seek to redemptively reconcile when they're at odds with one another. A community that will encourage one another to pray and to remember the Lord is at Hand. He's near. He is with you in whatever you're going through. And the reason why this community reminds each other of this is because they know how anxieties can divide our minds and how our discontentment can divide our hearts. In other words, it's a community that's cracked a contentment code and learned the secret <laughs> that in and of ourselves we don't have the power. We don't have the ability, nor do we have the sufficiency to be content with God. We can only do it through Christ's strength and sufficiency, enabling and empowering us. In other words, this book, it gives us a vision of the exalted Lord of glory recreating a community of believers who mirror and reflect Him, not just to one another, but to an unbelieving, watching world. And now, we come to the last section and the ending of this book. <laughs> and what's interesting, there are no imperatives. There are no commands in this section. Paul's ending is just a simple thank you. Thank you, Philippians. But it's a thank you that is actually a summary of the whole book. You see, Paul is grateful for their partnership in the gospel. He's thankful for their continued support of him and the way that they sacrificially gave to him. So yes, we are going to talk about money this morning, but only briefly. And we're not going to talk about it in a guilt you kind of way, but in a motivating kind of way. Because what we're going to see is how our resources are not just necessary for the furthering of the gospel, but when we sacrificially give, Paul's going to show us that it is a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So 
Because Paul does not give any commands, what's interesting about this is that it means embedded in his thank you is the reality of the gospel's power to change people, to conform them more and more into the image of Jesus. You see, the Philippians, they are so captivated by who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them that they have been changed, they have been transformed in such a way that they are reflecting Jesus' lowly, humble mindset in the way they sacrificially serve and give to the Apostle Paul. So, yeah, let's, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. And we're going to, I already preached on 10 through 13, uh, but we have to read it again to put it in context with the last section. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet, it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help from, for my needs again and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphrodites the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord. All right, you may take your seats, and I'll quickly pray. Father, shine on the page. Show us the glory of Jesus and what he's doing in this world, through the church, and in us individually. Open our eyes to see it. And by seeing it, may you change us more and more into the likeness of your Son. And we ask of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, to understand Paul's thank you, we need a little bit more background in the context here. Now, remember, Philippi, it's a Roman colony, right? It's located in Macedonia, which is modern-day Greece. And Paul established this church on his second missionary journey, which is found in Acts chapter 16, which we looked at. So Philippi is the first European church, (laughs) which means... This church is the reason why you and I have come to believe and hear and know about the gospel today in America, all right? In the first sermon, we looked at it in Acts 16, and we saw how diverse this church was, right? You have a very successful businesswoman named Lydia. You have an unnamed slave girl who was possessed by demons who Paul heals. And then we have this unnamed Roman soldier who we simply call the Philippian jailer. So it's a very diverse church, but it's a very diverse church that Paul deeply loves, and this church deeply loves Paul. You see, after Paul established this church, he continued on his missionary journey, and he went to Thessalonica. He went to Berea, he went to Athens, and then he went to Corinth. But even though Paul had left this church, this church still supports Paul. And we read about it in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 5, where Paul says, He's writing to the Corinthians, but here's what he says, describing this church, the Philippian church. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty 
have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, and I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. So did you catch Paul's description of the Philippian church? They were severely afflicted. I remember when Paul and Silas were there, they were afflicted, right? Paul and Silas, they broke Pax Romana, Roman peace, and all of the community came and a mob was gathered. They beat Paul and Silas and put them in prison. So no doubt this church is probably experiencing the same thing that Paul's experienced. Many of them are being beaten. Many of them might be put into prison because they won't bow the knee to Caesar. They will only bow the knee to Jesus. So what else does he say? They're also extremely poor, which means no doubt many of them probably lost their jobs by being a Christian. Many of them might have been kicked out of their business, had their businesses looted, been thrown in jail where they have no way to provide for their family. But notice, in spite of all this, Paul says they have an abundance of joy and they still gave generously beyond their means. And Paul says they actually earnestly begged him for the privilege of giving. So notice their affliction and their extreme poverty, it did not cause them to grumble and complain. Okay, whew, sorry. <laughs> they didn't say, hey, Paul, when we get back up on our feet, then we'll contribute to the cause of the gospel. You know, right now, we barely have enough to survive. And so we've got to take care of ourselves first. I hope you'll understand. No, Paul says they had abundant joy and they begged him in their extreme poverty. They begged him, please let us give. Which means Paul, knowing their extreme poverty, probably said no. I'm not going to take your money. But because of their earnest pleading and begging, he allows them to. Now look at verses 15 through 16 of chapter 4. And you, Philippians yourselves, know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, so this is he came to them, and then when he left, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So <laughs> this church is the only one who supported Paul financially. They're the only ones who gave to Paul, and not just once, but a couple of times. See, Thessalonica, it's 90 miles away. So this is no small feat for them to support him. And then here's what's interesting. When you continue reading in Acts after Paul leaves Corinth, they lose touch. He loses touch with the Philippian church for about three years because Paul goes to Jerusalem. And what happens to him when he's in Jerusalem, right? He's mobbed. He's beaten. He's thrown into prison. And because he's a Roman citizen, he wants to take his appeal to Caesar. But it took him three years to get there. Three years of trials, three years of incredible hardships, and he finally gets there. So look at chapter 4, verse 10. Because after they lost touch, this church had no way of supporting Paul until they found out that he was in prison in Rome. This is why Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the opportunity so at least four years have gone by without any contact between them. But when they learned about Paul's imprisonment, they immediately sent Epaphrodites with money, with food, with clothing. And look at verse 18. Paul says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied. This word well supplied means my account is actually overflowing. <laughs> having received from Epaphrodites the gifts that you sent. I mean, this gift is so generous. Look, it not only covers Paul's bills. Remember, he had to pay the cost of being in prison, <laughs> right? But his accounts actually overflow. And I don't want you to miss this. Rome is over 800 miles away from Philippi. 
So this is no small task for Epaphrodites to travel over 800 miles to serve and minister and to give Paul this gift. This trip was so strenuous in chapter 2, verses 25 through 30, we find out that Epaphrodites nearly died from some illness, but God mercifully spared his life. So this afflicted an extremely poor church, sacrificially gave to Paul above and beyond their means. And the question I had to ask myself is, why? Why, at great cost to themselves, would they sacrificially and so generously give to serve Paul? Well, I mean, on the surface, yeah, we could say, well, it's because they love Paul so much. And yeah, that's part of it, but it doesn't do justice to their perspective of the relationship that they share with Paul. Look at chapter 1, flip back to chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Paul thanks God for them, the Philippians, in all of his prayers for them. The thought of them, it brings joy to Paul's heart. Why? Because of their what? Partnership in the gospel. It's a partnership. So this is a church that has been so impacted by the gospel that has been so impacted by who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them that they view their relationship to Paul now as a partnership for the cause of Christ. You see, the Philippians, they gave gladly and so generously because they have been given and received God's grace so freely. Because the gospel has impacted their lives, they want others around the world to be impacted by it. So they give to Paul's mission. They give to Paul's cause of taking the gospel and extending it to people in places who've never heard about Jesus. So this church views their relationship to Paul as a partnership in the gospel. And so Paul, at the end of his letter here, is simply saying thank you. But I like how one commentator said, because I didn't know this, and this is a great observation. He says, Paul concludes the letter on the same note with which it began, with their mutual partnership in the gospel, which means then that this places this matter in the emphatic, the climactic position at the end, which means when Read aloud in the gathered community, these will be the final words that are left ringing in their ears, that their gift to him has been a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is pleasing to God. (laughs) Which means giving for missions, it's so much more than the way we view it today. Giving for missions, it's so much more than having pity on those poor missionaries who have to raise their support. Right and rely on other people's resources. It's so much more than that. What is it? It's a partnership. It's a partnership in the gospel. So you may not be able to go. You may not be called to go. But you can partner with and financially help support those who do. This is why what we're going to be doing as a church is we're going to be setting aside a separate account specifically for missions, specifically for outreach and other ministries like RUF. So right now, so much of our money, it's tied to what? It's tied to the building that we purchased a few years ago. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Because we've got to pay the bills in order to stay here. But here's what I want us to understand. I don't want us financially to stay at the place that we're at. I long for the day when we can be a 50-50 church, which means we are spending 50% of what's coming in on us, and we are giving 50% away for missions, for outreach, for RUF, and for other ministries. But we're not even close to getting to this point. We can't be at this point yet. But it doesn't mean we can't start praying. 
It doesn't mean that we can't start praying for God to grow us, for God to provide resources for us so that we can do this. Because remember, as a church, we don't exist for ourselves. We exist for God's glory extending and reaching other people locally, but also globally. Okay, I'm going to step off my soapbox, okay? Something else I want you to notice about this partnership, because it's a partnership. Paul isn't seeking the gift. And this is fascinating. He's seeking the fruit of what their gift means. Look at verse 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. <laughs> you see, the Philippians' generous gift to Paul is evidence of God's grace at work in their life. Which means the material support that they give Paul isn't the ultimate point. What delights Paul is what they're giving is giving evidence of. Paul delights in the fact that God's grace is working in their hearts so much so it's bearing fruit of generosity and sacrificial giving. See, their gift, it serves Paul's physical needs and his health, yes, but even more so, what does their gift show? Does it not show the spiritual health of the Philippian church? This afflicted and extremely poor church that gives so generously. And, which means then that the emphasis for Paul, it's not, oh, <laughs> that their giving is actually increasing their rewards in heaven. That's the way a lot of people view this verse. No, what Paul is emphasizing is how God's grace in Christ is impacting their lives, that it's bearing fruit now. That's his point. Because this church is growing in God's grace, what do they do? They generously and graciously give. And I want you to notice verse 18, though. Paul wants them and us to see that he isn't really the recipient of their service. God is. Their gift, Paul says, is a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And he's using the imagery of a burnt offering here, which means that the whole animal was consumed by fire. And you can picture the aroma, can't you? Because we can smell it every time we grill out, right? You just walk through your neighborhood and you smell somebody grilling out and your mouth begins to water, right? So imagine the picture he's giving here, the pleasing aroma from the sacrifice. It's waffling its way up to the nostrils of God, and it's pleasing to him. When we generously and graciously give out of gratitude for the grace that we have been given... Paul says it's a sweet-smelling sacrifice that's pleasing to God. But I don't want you to miss this. It's a sacrifice, which means it's costly. Every sacrifice is costly. The Philippians were extremely poor, and yet the gospel of God's grace in Jesus had so impacted their hearts that they opened their wallets to generously, generously and graciously give for the cause of the gospel extending. And then if we connect this with verse 19, look at this. This is fascinating because we see that because their gift was really given to God and not to Paul, Notice what Paul says, God, not Paul, is going to be the one who will reciprocate. See, in verse 16, the Philippians' gift had abundantly filled Paul and overflowed his accounts, and now in verse 19, Paul says, God is the one who will abundantly fill and overflow the Philippians' accounts. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And again, this verse has been so misused 
in the church today. <laughs> because people who promote what we call the prosperity gospel, they twist this verse to mean that if you give to our ministry, God is going to abundantly bless you financially. And i got to be honest, that's somewhat true. <laughs> um, that is a part of it. But notice what Paul says. God will fill up every need. Every need of yours, according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So yes, in the midst of extreme poverty, God will richly supply their material needs. But not just their material needs. God will abundantly provide for all of their needs. So think about it. In the midst of their affliction and suffering by opposition... This means God will abundantly supply the joy, the endurance, and the encouragement while they're going through it. In the midst of relational conflict going on in the church and their need to be unified, God will abundantly supply the grace and the humility necessary for them to stand together with the same mind. In the midst of running the race that we call the Christian life, <laughs> when we look back, when we look around and we stumble and fall, when we take our eyes off of Christ as the prize and become tripped up because we're looking at earthly things to be the prize, what does this mean? It means God will abundantly supply all of the forgiveness and all of the righteousness we need. In the midst of our anxieties, the Lord is present with us. He is near at hand, and God will abundantly supply us with his peace. In the midst of being discontent with God, God will abundantly empower and enable us to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So do you see what Paul is saying here, though? It's not just that God will abundantly supply for every one of our needs. According to his riches in Christ, he already has abundantly supplied us with everything we need. See, in Jesus' humble descent, in becoming a slave who lives for us and then dies for us, God has supplied us with everything we need in Christ. We already have it in Christ. You see, when you, when you think of the costly partnership of the Son with His Father, sacrificing everything, including His own life, for you and for your good, so that you could become a part of His family. When you think of Jesus giving up His glory so you could have His glory, when you think of Jesus sacrificing everything to become obedient to the point of death so that you could have all of God's forgiveness, so that you could be found in Christ and covered in his righteousness, when you think about God's grace being lavished upon you in Christ Jesus, what else is there to do but worship him? Which is what Paul does in verse 20. Paul bursts out in doxology, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. And did you notice the change in verse 19 and 20 though? In verse 19, Paul says, my God will supply. What does he say now in verse 20? Our God. See, it's not just my God, and it's not just your God. It's our God. 
our God who by his grace has united us to his son, but also to one another. So we are a family, despite our different ethnicities, despite our different backgrounds. We are a family. Which means, what's Paul doing in his ending? Does it not show us how Jesus is the center and focus of everything that God is doing in this world? Jesus is the center and the focus, not just for you individually and your life, and not just for us as a church, but also who Jesus is and what he has done is showing us what God's purpose is for the world. And what is this? What is he doing? The exalted Lord of glory is recreating a community who would mirror and display Jesus not just to one another in the church, but also to unbelievers who are not a part of the church. You see, I love Paul's final greeting here because it's like, well, what the heck does this have to do with anything? <laughs> what does he say? Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially who? Those of Caesar's household the praetorian guard that he's chained to on a six-hour rotation, 24 hours a day, whom Paul has shared the gospel with, where many of these soldiers became Christians. So think about it. Rome is the reason why Paul is in prison. But Rome is also the reason why the Philippian church is afflicted and extremely poor. But notice, because of Paul's imprisonment, <laughs> Many of Caesar's household have become brothers and members now of God's family. So what are we seeing? The power of the gospel has not only changed and transformed Paul's friends in Philippi, so much so that in, even in their poverty, they give above and beyond their means. But do we not see the power of the gospel extending and transforming to reach Enemies. Enemies in Rome. Making them brothers. Making them a part of God's family. So do you see how powerful the gospel is? Do you see how life-changing this letter is? It starts in verse 2 of chapter 1 with Paul saying, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it ends in chapter 4, verse 23, with the grace of the Lord Jesus going and being with them. So the only way to end this letter is the way Paul does. May God's grace and peace come to you through this letter. And may God's grace go with you from hearing it, from believing it, from receiving it. Amen.